Today here on uh, RumbleStrip.net and the False Neutral Podcast, we are joined with, we are joined by the uh, CEO of Ducati North North America, uh, Jason Chinook. Jason, thanks for uh, talking with us here. My pleasure. So you are here in Detroit. What brings you here? Uh, actually, Detroit is the first stop of our, the Ducati's More Than Red Tour. And actually what we're doing is we're bringing all of the new motorcycles that are in the 2018 lineup. Uh, to a selection of markets across the country uh, and to see whether sometimes in some cases we're doing it here at a dealership like Ducati Detroit and other places we'll be hosting some off-site events. Uh, but really what the idea here is to be able to get people excited and engaged in what we're bringing to market over, uh, over the coming season. Uh, but during the time of the year that where people are maybe a little bit more dormant, we're starting to get cabin fever and getting that itch to get out and ride. And uh, you just showed off the new uh Panigale V4 and V4 S. Yes. So they're pretty excited about those bikes, I'm sure. Absolutely. In fact, when we look at what we're doing for 2018, it's incredible for the product lineup. Uh, with starting with the Monster, the new Monster 821, uh, is actually will be coming out this year. In fact, we actually started delivering it, I should say, a couple weeks ago. The new Multistrada 1260, uh, the uh, 959 uh, Special Edition, which is a Ducati Corsa uh, Edition version of the 959 Panigale. As you mentioned, the V4, V4S, the V4 Speciale, and then for the Scrambler, we have the entire lineup of the new Scrambler 1100s, which is exciting as well. Uh, so for us, it's it's going to be a really, really good year. We're anticipating good things. So it, it, from my other uh, co-hosts on on the podcast, we'll get to a couple questions they have. But uh, one of them, one of them that um, Pete, who's part of our podcast, brought up is uh, Scrambler's been obviously huge. I mean, it is this sort of this decade or this uh, century's monster, right? I mean, it's yeah. it has transformed the company financially from a cash flow standpoint, much like the monster did in the in the '90s. And it's you've really got on that retro bandwagon, and 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 you know you've done well with it. But the question is, is it's a fashion, it's a trend, it looks to go for a while. But what's after what's after the scrambler? What do you, or what do you see personally? as the next big trend in motorcycling? Well, actually, I'm going to back up just a second because okay. it's, sure. it's a good question. Uh, but, you know, it's for us, we look at it as Ducati's always had one eye to our past because sure. part of our brand is our heritage. It's, heritage. Right. it's such an important piece of what we've done. And even if you think back to what we did in 2000, we brought out the MH900E, mm -hmm. which was the bike that was inspired by Mike Halewood's victory. Uh, that... that spawned this concept of the sport classics that we had for some years where I mean nowadays it's incredible uh, I remember when we were first bringing sport classics to market now those bikes are worth more than they were new right. at dealerships so we've always done something where we've had a little bit of a nod to, to the past and as the company's been able to grow we were able to expand our reach and in fact this is a big part of our overall strategy. This is why this tour is called More Than Red. Mm -hmm. Because people know Ducati for our super bikes. I mean, they know, when you think of Ducati, you think of Italian, red, sport, passion. Sure. But they don't necessarily know that we build a cruiser, which is the X Diablo, that we have the Multistrada Enduro, which the bike has been touted as probably the most capable dual sport enduro style globe trotting motorcycle out there of its category. Uh, and the Scramblers allowed us to have access to a different audience as well. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier in the evening the, uh, to the, the audience that was here, the Scramblers actually allowed us to have people that can enter in not only into the world of Ducati, but actually people that come new into motorcycling. Um, and we didn't necessarily look at it as a fad. We looked at something that we had done the Sport Classics. We said, well, how can we find a way to bring people in? Mm -hmm. Even the name Ducati and the Monster, the Monster in it, the name in itself, can be perceived as intimidating to a non-motorcyclist. And I even talked to some journalists who ha have ridden motorcycles, and they said, ah, Ducati, I'm not that good. It's like, <laughs> man, we, we make motorcycles that actually can, that run the gamut to bring people in. Because while there's this idea that we're a very exclusive brand, mm -hmm. um, Fortunately, by the nature of the word exclusive is to exclude people. I like to think of us as being very inclusive. It's like when you find out a really kick-ass restaurant that you've been to, you don't want to keep it to yourself. Well, you might. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> right. But like you tell your friends, right? You want to get people excited about it. That's what we want with Ducati. And so the Scrambler's given us the ability to do that. Um, 
it is very, it's been great for the company because it's helped gain, uh, have people consider the overall encompassing brand of Ducati mm -hmm. uh, through Scrambler's Eyes uh, that may not have ever considered us before. We've now become an option for them. Sure. Just like the Multistrada has, just like the X-Diablo. So from a strategic standpoint of our product lineup, it's really been very helpful. But in terms of talking about the, where's that next, the, the next trend that's coming, um, it's a good question. I honestly don't have the answer to that, and if I did, I could probably I'd be in a different position in the organization. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the reality is is that the world of sport motorcycling is uh, is has become more challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, that years ago when the recession hit, that a lot of the funny blending practices that were uh, out there, not by Ducati but by some other manufacturers had built an artificial stimulation of what was happening in the world of sport bikes, putting people on the bikes that maybe couldn't afford it. Um, and that's actually, what's the right word for it? It's a bit of a market correction. Yes. Uh, and right now we're, we're at our best ever performance of sport bikes that we've ever had since Ducati's existence in America, which is crazy. Part of it has to do with the fact that the market has gone down in sports segment, but it's also because we've become more accessible and we've not, been, we've not compromised who we are. Um, I think that from my perspective, what people are going to see in terms of, uh, I think the next trend, so getting to your question, sorry there, it was a long way to get there, it gave me a chance to think it through as well. Uh, but I think the next trend really is the connected motorcycle. And this is something that actually we've introduced with the Multistrada 1260. Uh, we put our toe in the water a couple years ago. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, a motorcycle is not transportation. Right? It's, it's a very... It's, At least not in this country. Yeah, definitely not in this country. And even in a lot of Europe, it's not... I mean, scooters are more practical for transportation around a lot of those cities sure. than the motorcycles are, really. Uh, but for us, in, as Americans, it's definitely not transportation. And even though I'm in Detroit and it's a transportation hub of the U.S., uh, for me, I think of motorcycling as entertainment. And Ducati, we're an entertainment company. Uh, and we sell motorcycles, but we also provide experiences and we have things that people are getting to more of the brand. And when you think about a brand, you think about something that, that stays with you when you're not actually utilizing it. Right. And that's to me is really important. It's when you get off that bike, we want to be part of your life outside of that. And, so. and, and you've done that a lot with the Scrambler in the sense of making its own sub brand within Ducati and really making it almost an own, its own lifestyle brand, right? Absolutely. Uh, but as we see the world going very digital and a lot of the technology that's actually allowing people to be connected, they're connected to things that they love, that they want, that they enjoy. And actually, you know, if you, as an example, some of the stuff that we're researching with the new Multistrada 1260 is that we're going to be able to understand how the motorcycle is being used and recommend to the rider some different rides that they might be able to go on. Or like as an example, if we see that you're taking your Multistrada 1260 for really tight, twisty rate rides, uh, and you decide to share that information with us, we might recommend that you register for the next track day that's being held with a local dealer. So for us, a way for us to connect with the customer off of the motorcycle and provide them value, mm -hmm. not, just, uh, not just selling them things, but provide actual value that gives them the chance to be able to live the lifestyle of a motorcyclist off the bike, sure. especially in... Detroit when it's actually it's forty something today, but yeah, when, yeah, when yeah, it was yeah, last week. It's been, it's been yeah, yeah in the in the in the negatives, so, negatives with the wind chills. So, so yes, I, I see that as being the next trend. It's actually one of the areas that we're really putting a lot of energy and effort into because we believe that it's something of value, and it will be a differentiator for us. You you've talked you mentioned the uh, Multistrada a couple times. It's obviously in the last what decade or so that it's been out now. Um, kind of trans a, a different ver different way of transforming of, of what you guys have done do you draw a parallel to that and, and the sort of that whole adv market more street based adv than off-road based adv as a two-wheel equivalent to sort of how crossovers have taken over in automotive uh everyone you want the appearance and you want some of that capability but you don't really want to give up any of the i'd say comfort but you, you don't want to, you don't want to have to compromise for the for the look, right? I, I, I definitely I can see I, I see exactly what you're saying, and I and I think that there is a part of that. Um, I think a big piece of it because I own a Multistrada myself. I own the first generation Multistrada Pikes Peak. Uh, I was very close with that project, so to me, I I have a 
I have a personal affinity for it. But when I ride that motorcycle, speaking as a motorcyclist, taking my Ducati hat off for a second, what I want to do is I ride it and I see a dirt road somewhere and I go, I could ride that if I want to. Sometimes I do, but most of the time I don't. But I think it's that idea that I don't want to be limited. And uh, especially when you don't have a lot of free time and you get those few chances to get out there and ride, you don't want to find yourself being limited by what you can and can't do. And I want to have my cake and eat it too. Sure. I can ride that Multistrada on the twistiest roads as fast as I need to. Right. Let's just say, and as yeah, yeah, yeah. dynamic as I need to, which is probably a little more than I should. But then I can do more if I want to. Uh, and for me, that idea or that sense of adventure when you're getting off on a motor, getting off on your motorcycle sounds a bit weird saying that that way. Uh, but when you're getting out on your motorcycle, uh, then you don't want that limitation. So I think that that's part of it. Um, I I do agree though that probably most people aren't utilizing the motorcycle to its capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also one of the reasons why we brought up the Multistrada Enduro. Right. Because we, we even saw the own natural limitations that the, the standard Multistrada had. So we wanted to make sure that if you want to travel the world, you can. Uh, and that motorcycle is, that's incredible. I mean, the, the fact of what you can do with that thing off-road for being as big of a bike as it is, yeah. it blows, blows me away. One of the first, there were a number of Ducatis I grew up lusting after, but the one that to me was attainable, that should have been attainable, but I made some interesting financial decisions out of college, um, as we all do, uh, was sort of that mid, uh, mid-90s mid 900SS, the full, oh, yeah. the full body carry. And to me, 851, yes, the 916, 955, 996, I mean, maybe one of the sexiest bikes that ever existed, but I always lusted after that 900SS, and then it disappeared for a while, well, it got weird for a while, mm -hmm. and then it disappeared, and you've kind of brought back that bike in a different in a bit of a different form and I, I I'm, I'm happy you did but I'm, I'm wondering if like has that market segment gone or is it one of those things of you can put it in there for those few people who are you, there's enough resources you can provide it for the people who want it uh, it's definitely not gone uh, it's very sick to me we launched it last year and it's very successful what I'm saying is you brought it yeah, back yeah we brought it back last year and and we were pleasantly surprised with how much excitement and acceptance that that motorcycle had, because we hoped it would. Yeah, um, it just seems like today in today's day, people want like the extreme of whatever is mm -hmm. right. If you want a super bike, you want a super bike. You want a cruiser, you want a cruiser. But that in between bike, which was so big for so many years, kind of went away. Maybe it's now coming back again. I, you, you know, your, I, your market data may say you you have a better handle on the market. You know, data. it's an interesting thing. We well, I do study the market data ad nauseum, but the reality is, is when we brought that bike to market, there really aren't any bikes that, that are compete with it, right. that sporty, uh, that have that practical sense of it as well. I mean, it, it walks that line, and we have a tendency to do that with a lot of bikes. Like when the Multistrada came in with the 17 inch wheel, or when the we brought the Hyper Motard to market, like those market segments didn't exist. Uh, what we saw this last year is, is that there were a lot of people that were riding super bikes for years, that as you get a little bit older, you don't want to give up, <laughs> yeah, you, you give up, you don't want to give up that, that spirit of a sport motorcycle, but you want the practicality and the comfort of, of backs, real and, world backs and wrists and yeah, exactly. belt or waist, waist sizes. The most fun you can have on the way to the chiropractor. Exactly. Right? You know, so I, I totally see what how that customer that came in, but it was really interesting. I was talking to a younger gentleman here tonight uh, who just had bought uh, a Japanese 600 uh, a couple years ago, and he's looking at his next step up to be the super sport. And he's so excited about like, he said it's approachable, it's the right power, it's the right ergonomics package because he's riding it around town, maybe a little country rides. Mm -hmm. He's not going to necessarily take it to the track, but he feels as if he does, that he could, he'll be capable enough to have fun. Yep. So it's, I think people are looking for that where, you know, not everybody has a garage full of motorcycles. It's, that world doesn't exist for everyone. I mean, even myself, I've had to move across the country a couple times where I'm paired down to two, God forbid. Right. Uh, but I want to make sure when I get on them that, I don't feel like I'm compromised mm -hmm. too much, right? Uh, but that I'm getting the best out of it. So, um, so I don't have this written down, but it's one I keep trying to remember. Remember to ask. And as it comes to motorcycles now, with all the electronics, with the connectivity that everyone wants, with emissions and Euro four and all that, mm -hmm. how hard is it to fight all the weight that's being tacked onto the bikes? Because I don't think people understand how heavy all the emissions and all the electronics are 
and, and what kind of weight they add to the bike? I mean, has that been uh, it's a, a good question question that I wish I was uh, better suited to answer you because I'm not in the engineering side of sure. the, the organization. Uh, but I can give you uh, an anecdote that I remember reading from years ago when we first brought the 1098 out. Uh, and it's one of my favorite stories that we've always had. And this gives you an, an understanding of really how Ducati's approach is to these things. Uh, our, the gentleman who's our global CEO, Claudio Domenicali, uh, was in charge of a lot of the different production for many, many years, spent years at, uh, at Ducati Corsa as well. And when we were designing the 1098, I mean, this is years ago, so from the 999 to the 1098, I remember this story of him walking over one of the uh, designers slash engineer, whoever it was, his desk, and he was looking at the shift lever of this motorcycle. And the designer was talking about how beautiful it was and like how nice it looked and blah, you know, talking about all the intricacies of detail and design. And Claudia is great, well, how much does it weigh? And the designer's like, well, I don't know. He's like, well, we need to know. So they found out the weight. They found out that it was actually just a couple of hairs, a couple of grams heavier than the predecessor. And he said, a motorcycle is the sum of its parts. I mean, we know this. Mm -hmm. So if everything you build, while it might be beautiful, if it weighs one or two grams more, go back. So he literally sent the designer engineer back to the drawing board, proceeded to the drawing board, and made them redesign it to be able to not compromise the aesthetic, but to ensure that we actually had that reduction of weight. I could say with confidence that with him as our global CEO, that that spirit is consistent because he's still very much involved in the level of detail in the engineering. Uh, and while yes, we do have these electronics that have, uh, that, have, that add weight, but also they add performance sure. and safety and a lot of other things that aren't just governmental requirements. Um, and actually a comment I want to make about the electronics, because I think this is really relevant. A lot of, and you can, when you drive a modern car sometimes, the electronics sometimes anesthetize the experience. You know, you go, okay, I, am I going faster? Sure. Because I don't feel it. But then you look down and you are. Not with the Ducati. You know, you grab the throttle of any of these motorcycles, and I don't care how much intervention you have on there, you still get that butterflies in your stomach, that, that visceral feeling that you get when you ride, um, when you expect when you ride a motorcycle. And for me, it's proud to be a part of a brand that has never less, lost touch of that. And in the motorcycle world, there's only really a couple brands that still really do that. Um, it's important that we push the boundaries of engineering, but that we don't lose the reason why we ride. And it's because it's that emotional connection that you have, man and machine and road. You know, that's illogical, doesn't make sense, but makes us happy. Right. So, um, Going back to a point you made earlier about Ducati always looking to the past, and you can't discuss future pro mm -hmm. future production, but uh, one of the questions that uh, one of my co-hosts on, on the podcast asked is, any hope, and this will go into a second question, of a new Supermono? I can tell you there's I, there's been no short talk of that anywhere. That, so no, I, I, I couldn't say with any degree of even uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. like, I mean, it, it's one of those things I think that we, we uh, wax poetic about it. It goes up on the whiteboard and like, yeah, we'd like to get to this, but... I've never seen it on a whiteboard. In okay. all the years of working with Ducati, I've never seen it on a whiteboard, except for that was cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think that... Uh, you know, it's great to hear that because then it's nice to have things that people go, oh, but only if. Because they said that about the Super Sport for years. We yeah. had dealers and customers saying, if you guys would bring a Super Sport back and follow it in that same spirit mm -hmm. as you're talking about, the old air-cooled Super Sports, and that's what this was. It's Well, it's a different motorcycle entirely. It's that same spirit yep. of what the Super Sport was. So. And that goes into, uh, into racing, which is Ducati's, I mean... For the hardcore Ducati person, it's all about the racing and everything else. It's like the Ferrari thing. Like, yeah, yeah, I, this all pays for the, to go racing, right? Yeah. That's what we all wish. Um, <laughs> um, could And the reason the Supermono in some ways makes sense is uh, there's been a big push now with like 400cc-ish racing. When, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, uh, World Superbikes changed the name of it, but it was the 300 class, the World Super, World Super whatever it was, and then... Moto America's doing it, I have friends up in Canada and that organization, they're doing it. So I'm thinking that, could Ducati do something like that? But no plans right now, but is it a market that would be of interest in the sense of there's another way to bring younger people or newer people into the market? Well, actually, there's a, there's a class that's going to be introduced in Moto class. America. Yeah, that's, uh, 
the rules are being flushed out and, and, um, and we're actually in the process of, hom of homologating a motorcycle okay. with Moto America for that, which shall yet be uh, not yet named. Uh, but we're working to find out if we can ensure that we can bring a motorcycle to that series that would be competitive and actually inspire those people that are the shade tree mechanics or the guys, you know, I mean, the whole idea is to bring people back yep. into the paddock yep. where they're wrenching and working on their bikes and getting people to the track. So uh, I don't see that happening, honestly, in a 400cc. It's okay. something that's a little bit more mid-level sure. displacement uh, and something that already exists for us. But we're very keen on wanting to encourage that because, you know, when you look at what our flagship is, the best place you're going to have a chance to experience what that bike can do is the track. Yes. So if we can encourage and we can feed the machine of people getting out to the track to get that experience, we'd love to do so. And then... We, before we started recording, we talked about, uh, for a second about um, uh, flat track has really made, in the last couple of years, made a big comeback here in America. I think it's got a little uh, uh, worldwide uh, uh, attention because of a non-Ducati MotoGP rider. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, with the Super Prestigio and all of that. Any, uh, and Indian, Indian obviously entered, entered back in last year, thankfully, because mm -hmm. we're all tired of Harley. Um, Ducati has dipped its toe in here and there uh, in the past with some privateer efforts. Any yeah. any thoughts on getting into American flat track? Well, just to be clear, our official statement on racing, uh, really when it comes to any sort of series style racing, is that it's our you know we're we're a we're a relatively small company, sure. a scrappy company that sells around fifty five thousand motorcycles a year, which is a drop in the bucket even in comparison to what Harley Davidson does in the western half of the U S. Right. Uh, so our efforts for official efforts of racing are always focused at the two highest levels from a global perspective, and that's MotoGP and World Superbike. But that being said, the privateer efforts that have happened in Mar American flat track, we definitely can't uh, ignore that. Right. It's something that those guys have been doing it for quite a few years, the Lloyd Brothers Racing. Mm -hmm. uh, we've encouraged, we've found ways to be able to support them a little bit off the record, if you will, sure. uh, with engines and some different things that have happened. And as we see the AFT series evolving, uh, we anticipate, assuming that there's going to be a team campaigning in it, to be more actively involved. Uh, in fact, I've been spending the last, literally the last month, and even up until today, uh, this morning, uh, working with uh, both the team uh, and the series about ways that we can be more actively involved. Because, you know, it's distinctively American, yeah. and that's always nice to have. And, uh, the Pikes Peak Racing Project uh, was has been my baby yep. since we first did it years yeah. ago, and 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 it's one of those things that I'm very passionate about because it's distinctly American. Sure. And I look at AFT as the same way. And so, if there's a way that we can be actively involved, where we can get our Ducati fans out there cheering, if somebody throwing something around the track, uh, then we're behind it. So it's it's in the works right now, yep. and uh, it's a bit a little early for me to to comment on anything that's confirmed, but we're fingers crossed. All right, last question, because I appreciate all the time you're taking with us tonight. Um, obviously, you're excited about your entire life. Yeah. You, you would have to be. What is the model or version of a model that you think people overlook in the Ducati lineup and then you're like, this is like a great bike that everyone overlooks for X reason. For you, what is that bike? Oh, that's a good question. You know, that's a very, it's a challenging question for me because I'm so close to it, yeah. you know, and, uh, and what I think one of the best all-arounder bikes that we build and, and you know, if in a perfect world, I'd have a garage with every single model because I love every model for what, what it brings to the table. Uh, but I think from an all-around riding perspective and what gets me out of bed in the morning and on also what I think that is a great entry into the world of Ducati from a, it's the Multistrada. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's overlooked. Uh, I think that I think that it's maybe underappreciated because there's, we we get so excited about when we bring a new bike to market, we sometimes forget to tell people all about why it's great. We just go, this bike is awesome, but what is it? And the riding experience for me is it's a cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. You know, I can have what that feeling I get that when I ride a super bike around the track, uh, but I can have it in a real-world riding experience and put my wife on the back if, if 
she's brave enough to do so. Right. Or I could go ride with my buddies up the canyon and let it all hang loose. And like the fact that I can, you can do that as a writer, like I, you couldn't do that, really couldn't do it 20 years ago in motorcycling. That motorcycle is the, the bike that gave us the ability to be able to, to have that. And I honestly, on the street, I don't feel it's a compromise. I don't feel it, you know, sometimes they say, well, it's the Swiss Army knife, it does everything. People talk about bikes like like It does everything good, but nothing great. I totally disagree. It does so many things great. Uh, and I think that if more people have the opportunity to get out and experience that bike, whether it be the 950, uh, which is actually an, an excellent actually entry into the Multistrada, or the Multistrada 1260, uh, that they would not be disappointed because the, our engineers put so much into that bike. It's, it's probably one of our, mo our most over-engineered, if there is such a thing, <laughs> uh, motorcycles because we know that it's a bike that allows people to come into our brand that might not necessarily naturally do, do so. All right, well, hey, I appreciate you. A lot, long, went a little bit longer than we expected, but appreciate your time, and uh, thanks for joining us with, on uh, RubbleScript.net and the False Neutral Podcast. Excellent. Uh, you now got a new avid listener and follower. <laughs> so, pleasure, man. Thank you, Jeff.